Hello, my name is Grant Thompson. Today I'll be talking about ecology and diversity. Explore how to create plant communities that mimic nature in urban spaces. For an outline of what I'll be talking about today, I'll give you a little bit of background on myself once we get going here. And for most of today, we'll be talking about the book Planting in a Post-Wild World, Designed Plant Communities by Thomas Rainier and Claudia West. I'll talk a little more about this book and why I'm using it uh, to organize this talk. I'll talk about the five key principles of designed plant communities and talk about how this works in design and practice. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Lisa Orgler at Iowa State University Department of Horticulture for some of today's content. I'll also make a quick plug. Kelly Norris of the Greater Des Moines Botanical Garden, as well as Lisa Orgler, put on a more intensive hort ecology design workshop. So if you like what you hear about today, you want to get more of an opportunity to get hands-on guidance, actually work with some design, uh, they do some workshops that uh, expand on this a little bit further. And I'll put this up at this slide up again at the end of the talk if you want to take down any more information. So as I mentioned, my name is Grant Thompson. I'm an assistant professor of horticulture at Iowa State University. Primarily, I'm involved with our teaching program. I teach uh, woody plant materials, landscape and hardscape installation, and our plant propagation course. I also have a research program in sustainable landscape management. I'm an Iowa native. My research background is in urban ecology, both above ground and below ground. So I'm interested in plants and soils, microorganisms, and how we can use all of these to design more sustainable spaces. I'm also a professional landscape architect and horticulturist. When I was a practicing landscape architect, I worked on projects throughout the state of Iowa, including many different ecological areas, uh, wetlands, rain gardens, some shoreline restoration, as well as some therapy gardens and other commercial and residential landscapes. So as I launch in today's talk, I want you to consider these native landscapes. On the left, we have the Luss Hills in western Iowa. On the right, we have a typical upland woodland understory landscape. Take a look and see what you see here. In nearly all of these landscapes, there's complete plant coverage. Different species are intermixed, overlapping. The landscapes are really lush, even when they're dormant. Bottom line, here we see are lots and lots of plants. Now consider these kind of more traditional residential or commercial horticulturally designed landscapes. We have individual plants that take up distinct spaces, lots of mulch, not a whole lot of community, uh, plants interacting with one another. They're all kind of individual and lonesome in these landscapes. Now consider this approach. This is an approach to landscape design and plant design of what we call designed plant communities. Plants are selected to coexist, mingle, spread out, and exist in conjunction with one another. These types of landscapes are inspired by natural settings, and they rely on ecological principles at work in unmanaged landscapes. But these plant selections and the plant communities are adapted for managed urban conditions, quite a bit different than the horticultural landscapes we saw in the previous slide. So in planting in a post-wild world, Rainier and West call these designed plant communities. And the definition that they like to use is that they're translating uh, wild plant communities into a cultural language, things that are easily understood by humans as well as just generally accepted in terms of their overall aesthetic and how we take care of those different plant communities. And bottom line, they represent a hybrid of ecology and horticulture. So this is taking what we know works in the natural world, using them with cultivated plants, and making these designed urban spaces. And I'm using this book as a guide to this conversation. It's not the only book to suggest the style of planting design, but I think it does a pretty good job of explaining it in a way that works for experienced landscape designers, as well as those who are maybe new to thinking about landscape design or thinking about design plant communities. It's a good starting point for a book, but again, it's not the only one uh, that covers this kinds of topic. So when we think about design plant communities, we start by taking cues and making observations in native uh, communities. These are unmanaged landscapes. And these design plant communities require two basic things. First, 
all of the plants that exist here must thrive under similar environmental conditions. So if the plants don't work together, if they don't uh, need the same requirements, then it's really hard to have them exist as a community. The second primary requirement is that they're compatible in terms of their competitive strategies. This means that plants grow at a similar rate, one is not going to become totally dominant over another, and again, that they will exist under the same environmental conditions. So here we have an example of an oak savanna habitat. You can see the overstory oaks, some sparse shrubs, uh, lots of open space that are filled in by different kinds of grasses and forbs. Uh, so this is one kind of plant community that we can use as a reference when we start to develop what a design plant community would be. So what kinds of plants should we use in a design plant community? Again, we can look at natural landscapes as inspiration and then figure out how we translate those into other design communities. So for example, we can be inspired by unmanaged or naturalistic landscapes, but we're not necessarily tied to the exact same plant palette, nor do we have to use native plants necessarily in these designs. We're going to observe what we see in these native landscapes and then translate them into what that means for our designed gardens. So I mentioned there for a moment, maybe not always thinking about native plants. So I want to take a moment here to think about what are native plants. You probably have talked about this in previous discussions through Master Gardeners or different gardening uh, workshops or resources you've been involved with, but I want to think about this clearly in terms of Iowa. So in the past 15,000 years, different parts of what is now Iowa have been covered by glaciers that have bull uh, bulldozed away topsoil and dropped little bits of Canada across the state as the glaciers receded. Parts of Iowa have been fire-adapted prairies and savanna grazed by different large megafauna, which no longer roam these areas. Parts of Iowa have received windblown soil from Nebraska and the floodplains of the Missouri River, and this now forms what is the Lus Hills along Iowa's western edge. Many parts of Iowa have been plowed, farmed, and developed into cities. And of course, flooding is constant in Iowa. As a landscape, we are surrounded by rivers, uh, and rivers and creeks flow through it, and deposit soil whenever these floods occur. So when we think about native plants in this context, given that there's so much change that has occurred over history in Iowa, how do we define what are native plants? To where? To when? And is that relevant now? Take a moment and consider this amongst yourselves. Maybe think to yourself for a moment and turn to a neighbor and discuss this, but I want you to think about what challenges or problems might there be with the concept of native plants, or what constraints might there be to native plants in urban landscapes? And when I say urban, that can be downtown Des Moines, that can be an area in your own backyard. It's developed. It's no longer the natural landscape that it would have been before humans have developed it. So take a few moments and think about these topics. So a few things that I'd like to point out about native plants in these landscapes is first of all, much of what we know having existed in Iowa comes from early survey records during the early and mid 1800s when Iowa was settled by Europeans. We do have records of older native plants from different means, but when we develop what is called a native plant list for a particular region, we're usually confined to roughly 150 or 200 years or so when we have documented records saying what plants used to be here. So that's a pretty narrow range in terms of ecological or uh, geological time. You know, if 200 years isn't an appropriate time span to consider what's native, then how far back can or should we go to consider whether a plant was native to a region? And if we go back further and further in time, how do we know that it was here? We can also think about urban areas. So these are already greatly altered from what they would have been in their native state. The soils are different, the hydrology or the way that water moves across the landscape is different, and even the climate is different. In urban areas, we have lots of different hardscapes that 
receive and reflect heat back out into the environment. So the question is, is what is native to these environments? And you don't even have to be in a major city to experience what this happens. Anywhere that we disturb soils, we do different kinds of development, we're affecting what those landscapes are and the plants that can then thrive in those disturbed landscapes. And in the bottom right here, I have a scene from the Field of Dreams, and I want to point out this kind of, um, I'll call it a myth or so, of native plants. In the bottom right here, I have this image from the Field of Dreams. And what I'd like to point out is this general perception that if you plant native plants, things will come back, that somehow just planting a plant that used to grow here fixes everything. And often that's not the case. Even though native plants can be extremely important in terms of habitat restoration, there's so much more that goes into it. We have to work with the soils that are on the site and do different kinds of soil remediation. We have to make sure that the plants that we plant can then propagate and grow themselves. We need to attract pollinators, which may no longer be in the area, or other animals that both rely on and use these native plants and continue their propagation. So there's a lot more than just goes into planting. So instead of if you build it, they will come, it's if you build it, will they come? If we plant native plants, does that solve everything? I would say not entirely. So when we think about design plant communities, we should place an emphasis on a plant's ecological performance, not its center of origin. So what is it doing for us, not necessarily where it's from? Native plants are good, but adapted, non-invasive plants can also be suitable choices, particularly if the places we want to put them are harsher and those plants are better suited than some of the plants that we would consider native to our region. And the bottom line that I'd like you to take away here is that it's not a black or white issue, but it's often treated as such. It's go native or go home. But I think that there's lots of opportunity to use plant materials that can be suitable for these sites. So when we think about this, there's probably three parts to this equation. The right plant, the right place, dependent upon the different site conditions you're working with, and the right reasons. Ultimately, when we think about planting design, we want to know what are those plants doing for us, both aesthetically, what do they look like in the landscape, and functionally, what are they getting us when we put these in. And I actually like to think about this when I teach my students, I flip this around, and this becomes the equation of how we pick our plant materials. What do we want it to do? So what's our reason? What are the site constraints that we have to work with? So what is the right place? What is the place? And then finally, using those to help us pick what is the right plant for that situation. So instead of starting as with the plants, we use the other constraints to help us develop a plant list for this site. And this kind of thought process is also supported by uh, the Rainier and West book. So I'll begin here talking about the five principles that Rainier and West put forward in their book. And the first principle is related populations, not isolated individuals. So here you can see this uh, image of a lush planting here to the right. And so let's explore what Rainier and West say about this first principle. First of all, they suggest not placing plants like objects, that they're not furniture in a room, we don't compose them that way, and that we should use plants in masses. So plants should be grouped together in a way that they interact with each other and with the site. So the plants are grouped based on their environmental needs, where they're going to grow well. And finally, that each plant is part of the larger puzzle. So the equation that I shared with you a moment ago, the right reason, the right place, and ultimately those defining the right plant, that's part of the underlying message that Rainier and West like to convey. So let's explore this in a little more detail. On the left, we have traditional planting design, what might be considered a horticultural arrangement of isolated individuals. You can see lots of mulch here, and maybe the massings are of the same plant or similar plants, different cultivars, but they're all kind of placed individually in the landscape. They're all standing alone as if they're in their own furniture in a room or sculpture on display. On the right, we have a designed plant community that Rainier and West highlight in their book. Uh, 
and they have different focal point or arrangements of plants uh, throughout this landscape. So there's different pops of color, there's different forms, there's different textures. There's not a lot of open space between the plants. They get kind of messy, they bump right up to one another, but still it's confined within this orderly frame of these gravel paths. So clearly someone cares about this landscape, it's maintained, but the plants within those orderly frames are kind of messy. There's not a lot of mulch here either. It's plants, full and full of plants. Here are another couple of examples. So on this left, we have this fairly urban courtyard. And again, there's sprawling plant materials, no bare ground. The plants are often not in neat or tidy rows. They're interspersed with one another. And you have clumps or pockets of different uh, plants of the same species. But they're not in drifts like some other planting designs. But overall, the space still looks fairly managed. And that has to do with the paving elements, the furniture, the different boardwalk. So again, there's a cue that someone cares about this kind of landscape. And on the right, we have a more naturalized planting design, including these granite steppers. There's creeping ground cover that moves in and amongst the cracks of these different steppers. And taller herbaceous and grasses that overlap between the stones and form these dense pockets of lush vegetation. And again, not a lot of bare ground, not a lot of mulch in either one of these examples. Rainier and West set out principle two, and here they say that stress is an asset. So for example, in this right image here, we have a blooming coneflower prairie. This happens to be on calcium rich soils that were developed from a limestone bedrock. And some species are not adapted to this really high or alkaline pH. So if we spend a lot of time trying to quote unquote improve these soil conditions to make them more neutral, that would actually open up the plant palette and allow a lot more different uh, kinds of plants that like that more neutral range to be planted. And along with the desirable plants that we might get in this landscape, we'd actually probably see an increase in the incidence of weeds. Weeds that are maybe more adapted to those neutral conditions as opposed to the alkaline conditions here. So digging into this, Rainier and West say to accept the environmental constraints of a site. Don't add richer soil. Don't prune your trees to increase sun. Don't plant things to increase shade, provide irrigation. Just basically work with what you have and let the plants that you select fit that site. And what they also say is that you can embrace a more limited plant palette that, uh, that tolerate those particular conditions and that different plants will prefer different conditions. And so across even a small backyard garden, you may have a shady wet area, a sunny dry area. You may have areas that get different amounts of heat because of how close they are to a building or a driveway or a dryer vent. And that we can use these different pockets, even in a small landscape, these different stresses, to help us pick different and adapted plant materials. And that actually creates pockets of diversity within these landscapes. Different plants prefer different environments, and we can take advantage of that. So let's take a look at a couple more examples of how this might work. On the left, we have a fairly dry, sunny site. There's a lot of reflected heat from the pavement and the masonry of the buildings. And so plants that are adapted to those dry, uh, hot environments are chosen. And again, that looks really lush, not a lot of mulch, the plants are grouped together. You can see how principle one is also acting on this site. On the right, we actually have a low angle image of the Ellings Hall green roof here at Iowa State University. This is a manufactured green roof. It's rather dry, sunny, it's in a hot location, it's on the roof of a building, and the soil uh, or substrate profile here is actually pretty thin. And so we have a plant community that tolerates those different stressful conditions. These plants were seeded across the landscape and grown in on the green roof. And how they end up massing and uh, appearing here is totally a function of what plants survived in which places across this green roof. We can also see how this might work in a more residential setting. So here on the left, we have a moderate to dense shade backyard probably some fairly high moisture. You can see how the plant materials are layered together. There's lots of different interest from the hydrangea up front, 
some of the ferns in the mid and the back. You can see a pool of sunlight um, back behind the bench towards the garden shed. Uh, so lots of different opportunities within this landscape that takes advantage of the different gradient of sunlight and probably moisture that works through this backyard garden. On the right, we have a different example of what a high moisture landscape might look like. But in this case, these irises growing by this um, garden pond, uh, they'll take full sun. So we can play with sunlight, we can play with moisture, and we can use these different gradients, these different stresses to our advantage. Principle three uh, that Rainier and West put out is that we should cover the ground densely by vertically layering plants. So they point out that rarely do we see bare soil in the wild. We see this where there's been some kind of disturbance, a tree falls down, rips up the soil, or a fire moves through, or something else. But that bare ground doesn't exist for very long. Plants immediately start to grow and populate, and within a season or two, there's no bare ground to be seen. And they also point out that if we don't fill these bare spaces, weeds will. There's constantly a uh, pressure of different weed seeds. Um, maybe they're coming from a neighbor's yard or your own yard or in different situations. But if there's bare soil, that's opportunity. And if we don't put something desirable there, weeds will fill it in. And they point out that we should arrange plants not just side by side as if you were arranging furniture in a house, which we mentioned in principle one, but that you should actually arrange plants on top of one another to form layers of plants. So we have things growing low to the ground, we have some things that grow up or over the top of those, and so on. So usually our ground covers are somewhat shade adapted, but overall we have this layering of plants vertically that makes for these designed plant communities. So if we take a look at a maybe a traditional residential planting, how long does it take before this newly mulched bed becomes weedy? And how often do you end up weeding your mulch? Even when we use landscape fabrics or newspaper or cardboard, we're developing an area suitable for weeds to grow on top of that, and they will. They'll grow on top of the cardboard or the landscape fabric, whatever we put down. And so we add more mulch. Year after year, we add more mulch because it breaks down and because we're trying to deal with the weeds that we have. And so yes, organic mulches can improve our soil quality, but mulching is actually a short-term short form of weed control. And if you don't keep adding it, you have to keep weeding, and eventually the weeds can take over these nicely arranged beds. And I'll also point out there's emerging research in terms of how soil organic matter is developed. And this research actually emphasizes the role of microorganisms and how they break down different plant residues to form soil organic matter. And what this research is indicating is that fine roots that die and turn over in a year, so our plants are still living, but they produce root systems and some of those roots turn over, and the exudates that roots put out into the soil, so these are simple sugars, other compounds, these actually feed the microbes and they're really good food sources, they're highly digestible. But things like wood mulch are less digestible to these microorganisms. So yes, while mulching can and does improve our soil quality, we actually have to put in a lot of effort to sustain these landscapes. We can also see here where we have exposed areas. Um, we can di get different weeds growing. So this is purslane growing next to a gravel sidewalk. And why would purslane grow here? I mean, it's a pretty harsh environment. It's really hot and dry. But there's space, there's nutrients, there's no competition. So weeds in general are opportunistic, and any time that there's space that they can be competitive in, they will take over. So when we look back at native landscapes, we can see how densely planted that they typically, or den how dense the plants grow in these landscapes. On the left, we see a dense understory of a coniferous forest. It's full of plants, not a lot of bare soil, and even the senescing ferns dying and turning brown in the foreground adds seasonal interest to this landscape. So even though it's green, we don't see a whole lot blooming at the moment, we can still have different visual interest in these kinds of spaces. On the right, we have a restored Iowa prairie full of different plants growing densely over the top of one another, 
leaving little ground for weeds to get established. And even if we had weed seeds coming into this system, seeds need good soil, seed to soil contact to begin to germinate and grow. So the plant material itself can actually intercept those weed seeds and prevent that seed soil contact. So again, dense vegetation helps us out. So let's take a moment and think about how this works in a design setting. Oftentimes designers, and even if you're sketching something for your own backyard, you might start with what's called a plan view. This is a bird's eye view or otherwise looking down on the landscapes. And so plants are usually drawn as different size circles or maybe other graphical symbols to indicate how they look. So this is a plan view and the canopy looks super full. We can see that the circles are overlapping and we don't see or we don't perceive rather that there's a whole lot of bare ground here. Another way we can think about design is in what's called section. So this is looking if we were to cut through the landscape and see the plants growing vertically and this is the exact same design, but instead of looking down on it, now we're looking at it in section. And we can see that there's actually a lot of bare ground under those tree canopies, areas that would be uh, available for weeds to begin to grow. And furthermore, if we take a look, instead of using 2D representations of our design, if we look in a 3D uh, way, so in a perspective drawing, we can actually see that there is a whole lot of bare ground, even though in plan, this looks like a very densely planted landscape. So even just the graphical ways we represent this as designers kind of trick our perceptions into how densely planted these landscapes are. The bottom line is there's a lot more room for plants than we give ourselves credit for. So Rainier and West would suggest that instead of using different kinds of mulch, we can use plants themselves, that they can be the green mulch that covers our soil. So ground cover can be a diverse mosaic of plants. We can have multiple species with similar requirements. They'll all take a bit of shade because we have other plants growing up over the top of them. But if we plant them densely, the need for us to continuously remulch these landscapes is greatly reduced. That actually increases the sustainability of these sites because we're having to do less, uh, we're adding less in order to maintain them. Here is an example of a street side garden in a residential setting, and it's rife with lush, dense plantings. And it creates an oasis, even though just on the other side of those plantings is a small neighborhood street. Again, not a lot of bare soil, not a lot of mulch, and layers of plants. But at this point, you might start to ask yourself, well, what about competition? If we have all of these plants growing in and among and over one another, do we have problems? Are plants able to get the water, the nutrients, the light that they need? And I'll point out that plants have adapted different strategies for tolerating stress and competition. And even below ground, plants have developed lots of different strategies, what we would call root morphologies, or the root architecture of plants, to, de uh, to deal with some of these different stresses and competitions. So roots will go to different depths, they occur at different densities, and they have different symbioses with soil microorganisms, such as mycorrhizal fungi. And all of these help with below ground competition, let alone all of the different strategies plants have adapted to compete above ground. But not only are plants able to compete in space above or below ground, they can also compete with each other in time. So plants have different needs of different resources and can grow at different parts of the growing season. So for example, the spring ephemerals that we see across a forest understory, things like trillium or trout lily, they're growing where the trees above them haven't leafed out yet. They can still get the sunlight they need and complete their growing cycle, before everything else is leafed out. So they're competing when others aren't. And that strategy is actually one that a lot of weeds use as well. So growing early in the growing season, these are overwintering annuals, things that we can try to manage depending on how we plant our landscapes. Principle four of Rainier and West's book, they say that we should make our landscapes attractive and legible. They point out that humans have a preference for orderly landscapes, things that are easy to understand. So if you can look at a landscape, even if you don't totally understand plants, if you're not a plant person, you can see that there's care, 
You can see where there's areas of safety that you're not being obscured by plant materials. And you can start to understand what's in the distance. So here on the right, I've shown this image before. This is our granite paver pathway. We have low growing ground covers, grasses and forbs in the foreground. We have some evergreens in the background that kind of points interest and draws our eyes back into the landscape. But we can see there's a clear path. It looks like there's interest back there that it's drawing our eye into this landscape. And so it's attractive and it's legible. Rainier and West point out that spaces must be beautiful in order to be valued. No one wants or will pay for uh, a less than desirable or an ugly landscape. So of course we need to make them beautiful. Uh, why not? And they point out that cues for caring are often necessary in these landscapes. So they say that using orderly edges or frames can help. And even when you have messy and layered plant material, if you have these little cues throughout the garden, like the granite pavers in this pathway, that can help, again, people understand that this is, in fact, a maintained landscape. So here on the left, we have two different angles of the same house. And in the top image, we can see a very lush, dense planting. And that, to some people, may actually look weedy. Uh, I think it actually looks pretty nice, but that's, that's my interest. But from a different angle, we can see that there's a very clean, neat sidewalk, and we can see that another part of the landscape is actually closely maintained lawn. And so this is that signal to care to people in the neighborhood that this house, no, that, that high-growing landscape on the left is actually intentional, that there is that cue to care that it is maintained, and that makes this acceptable to the neighbors. You may not care what the neighbors think, but it's one way that you can show that you are actually maintaining this landscape. Now in the image on the right, we do have a very closely maintained lawn behind this border planting. But I would say even without the lawn, this border planting is very clearly a maintained or a developed landscape. All of the different hues of purple and pink and blue, those wouldn't naturally assemble in that. So again, that's a cue to care. Someone organized and put those plants together and picked that color palette and there's an intention to it. And so showing that cue for care or that intention in the landscape helps uh, create that legibility factor that Rainier and West uh, point out. The fifth and final principle that they point out is that we should work for management, not maintenance of these landscapes. They go into pretty good detail in the book talking about how maintenance is often trying to keep something in a static state, maintaining it to a certain quality, a certain situation, but that management actually allows for change. And so we're not worried about maintaining an individual plant, this tree or that shrub or that masses of grass, but that we want to manage things at a community level. We want to make sure that all of the plants are doing reasonably well or just that the whole community on average is doing well. And so management allows for change. Some plants will struggle year to year. Some will thrive depending on what the season brings us. And yearly, the garden may look better sometimes and not others. But overall, when we do our management, we're trying to preserve the community. We're trying to keep the layers and the general balance of species and this allows for some variation. So on the image on the right, you can see these uh, strip plantings. I've shown this before. There's the gravel pathways between them. And so we have these pockets of flowering forbs and grasses, these pops of color. But again, we're not worried about is an individual plant in one spot right in the center of one of those strips doing well. We're worried about how it works overall, season after season, how we manage this and not worry about maintenance. And so if we dig into a little bit of plant ecology here, we can actually start to understand in greater detail what Rainier and West mean. So in this top image, on the bottom axis, we have a light gradient. So on the left, we have full sun, and on the right, we have full shade. And on the y-axis, we point out the number of individuals in a population. And so the left curve is our little blue stem, and we can see that in a full sun setting, little blue stem is pretty happy. We'll have lots of little blue stems. 
but as we have more and more shade, their population tapers off. And on the right curve, we have Pennsylvania sedge, and that as we get increasing amounts of sh shade, that sedge will take over. So there's an optimum depending on what the sunlight gradient is between these two plants. And that's just two plants. We could have lots of different plants on the same sunlight gradient. And depending on what that individual species or cultivar's needs are, that population optimum will change. We can also think about this in terms of other gradients. So in a given garden, you may have a different soil moisture gradient, a different fertility gradient, different heat loadings, and on and on and on. You can probably think of many different gradients in your own landscape. And that if we're choosing plants to exist in these different communities, they'll experience different optima depending on what the season brings. So a design plant community has different species that can take advantage of these different gradients and take advantage of them to different degrees. So if we think about this in a little more detail, we remember that principle two, stress is an asset, and principle five, management, not maintenance. So if we abstract the diagrams that we saw in the previous slide, we end up with something like this. So on the x-axis, we have some environmental gradient. Could be moisture, could be light, could be fertility, the list goes on. On the y-axis, we have still the number of species in a given population. And to either side of this gradient, either side of this bell curve, becomes increasingly more stressful. So we have fuller and fuller sun, or fuller and fuller shade, lots of water, very, very dry conditions, and so on. So the number of plants that like things in the middle, just the right amount of sun, just the right amount of moisture, are pretty high. And that's the top of our bell curve. But as we moved in our gradient to either direction, either right or left, we increase the amount of stress, and fewer and fewer plants are going to like those more and more stressful situations. So resource inputs that try to change this environmental gradient are maintenance practices, and they often require ongoing efforts. So think about this. If you have a low fertility site and you're trying to increase the fertility, you have to keep fertilizing year after year as those nutrients are used up or leached or otherwise no longer available to the plants. Same thing with irrigation or liming to change pH. They're ongoing efforts, and the more effort you have to put into that, the less sustainable your landscape is. We can also think about this in different ways. So this is the same curve that we have on that top image. Now we have it down here at the bottom. And if we put in different kinds of inputs to alleviate those stresses, and so we add water or we add fertility, we change the range of plants that will exist in that zone. So we're moving it to a more moderate or a more neutral condition that more plants might tolerate. But not only more desirable plants, we also increase the potential for weed pressure. So if we work at the margins, if we embrace the stress of our site, it narrows our plant palette, but it also narrows the weeds that will be competitive in that same environment. So with principle five, Rainier and West stress management, not maintenance. So things like watering, mulching, spraying, pruning, and even leaf litter removal, we generally don't do once the plants are established. And so there's a couple of important points that I want to make here. First of all, once the plants are established, we certainly do need mulch in the beginning, we need water in the beginning, and we need to get our plants, the desirable plants in these design plant communities, growing well. Only once we have that community growing well are they going to be competitive against weeds and are they going to give us the outcomes that we want. So yes, there is some upfront work we need to do to get these going well. The other thing is that they're generally avoided. If you're used to watering or mulching or fertilizing year after year, you may do it occasionally. You may water in the really, really droughty years. You may do some of these things, but the degree to which you do them is going to be much, much less than in a typical landscape that you're used to working with. And so ultimately management is necessary to keep the ground covered so to keep bare soil away and keep the plants that we want healthy and vibrant, to preserve the overall aesthetic of the plants, and to prevent aggressive plants, so aggressive invaders uh, from dominating these landscapes.
and not just aggressive invaders, even sometimes we may find that plants that we wanted there initially are maybe just too successful and they out, end up out competing the other plants in our community. So ultimately, a manager is more of a referee than a prison guard. We're trying to make sure that everyone is competing fairly with each other than trying to keep them strictly maintained the way that we originally intended. Another way that we can think about this is that management is necessary to keep the portfolio diverse. If you're using it to think about this in financial terms, you might be pretty familiar with a diversified stock portfolio being beneficial. So here on the top image, we have a diverse stock portfolio. It's going to be well buffered against different shocks to the economy. Overall, if the economy is doing well, this portfolio is going to do well. We can think about our plant communities the same way. If we have diverse communities, one season stress, so a summer that's a little wetter or a little drier than another, you'll have a shift in which species in that community are more dominant. So you may have species A doing very well when under dry conditions, but species C doing much better in a little bit wetter year and so on. And in the biodiversity literature, we actually call this the portfolio effect. And so that a diverse portfolio on average does better. Certainly, just like with a financial portfolio, you could have all of your money in one stock that does really, really well that one year and you make a boatload. You can also have a lot of money in one stock that does really poorly. So the same way with plants in the landscape, some years there are winners, some year there are losers, but on average, the long-term average, a diverse portfolio is better. We also, in the diversity literature, see that this is called the insurance effect. And so in the literature, it says that the greater diversity means a greater likelihood of community stability. So again, one year, a particular plant may not do too well, but if we have lots of plants in our design community, overall, the community survives and looks pretty good. So how does this work in terms of working with design plant communities? What is this actual design process? So first, we're going to utilize landscape archetypes as references and inspiration. We're gonna break down those inspirational landscapes into different vertical layers of plants. So we're going to start to organize and understand what we observe in these native landscapes. And lastly, we're gonna identify multiple plants for each layer and then combine those to make our designed plant community. So what do we mean by landscape archetypes? Well, the essence of a place, things that elicit emotional responses from these different kinds of landscapes. The most basic and memorable vegetation patterns of that place. And rather than imitating a native plant community, we're gonna be inspired by those patterns. So again, what do we mean by landscape archetypes? Well, I've listed here three different archetypes that you might be familiar with. A Midwestern prairie, a Pacific Northwestern woodland, or an Eastern hardwood forest. And for a moment, I want you to close your eyes and envision what those landscapes look like. And I have intentionally not added images to this slide because I want you in your mind's eye to see what that looks like. So go ahead and close your eyes for a moment. What are the dominant forms that you see in this landscape? What are the colors that are popping out at you? What are the different textures in the foliage, in the woody material? What's the quality of light? If you know specific plants in this landscape, what are they? If you don't know specifically what they are, what are they like in general? Now that you've had a moment to envision these landscapes, open your eyes. So with these different landscape archetypes that we have, we can start to zone in or zoom in on those different aspects. So take a look at the chosen archetype that you have, the Midwestern Prairie, the Pacific Northwestern Woodland, or the Eastern Hardwood Forest. Start to group the plants by height. 
Which ones are really tall? These are going to be our overstory plants. Which ones are moderate height? These are our understory plants. And which ones are very near the soil surface? These are our ground covers. Notice how these different archetypes are all very different from one another. Now think about your own home. What archetype might be most appropriate for your house? And maybe there's not one here that's most like your own home. If that's the case, then what is the right archetype? What's the natural analog for the landscape that you have? And consider that in terms of your site conditions and the stresses present in your site. So now we can start to break this into layers. Rainier and West talk about a structural layer, a seasonal theme layer, and a ground cover layer. And so we can actually think about those top two layers, the structural layer and the seasonal layer, as our design layers. And the ground cover layer is our functional layer. And I'll explain what those mean here. So our design layers create legibility in the landscape. These are those dominant patterns that we see, what makes the Pacific Northwest forest different than the Eastern hardwood forest. They give our seasonal interest. These layers contain our pow or our wow plants, the things that just make you stop and that take your breath away. So those are our structural and our seasonal layers. In our functional layer or our ground cover layer, this is where we have an opportunity to create a really diverse landscape. So these are our ground covers, this is our green mulch, this is what's keeping everything intact and letting those seasonal layers and the structural layers really stand out and be spectacular. So choose the archetype that you're familiar with, the Midwest Prairie, the Pacific Northwest Woodland, or the Eastern Hardwood Forest, and now begin to break these apart into these different layers. Take a few minutes here and visualize, describe, or list how these layers work in your landscape. If you know specific plants, go ahead and note them out. And after you've had a few moments to work on this, compare with your neighbor. If you have the same landscapes, note how your lists are similar or maybe different. Or if you have different archetypes, how does their archetype compare to yours? Take a few moments with that here. After you've had a few minutes to talk with one another, to share your archetypes and maybe compare and contrast what you have, this is the exact same process that you can go through with residential design as well. So you're going to choose an archetype that's appropriate to the site conditions and the stresses that you have. You're going to translate that natural landscape, that unmanaged landscape archetype, into how that works for your own home garden. So here are some different layering examples. In this example from Rainier and West book, we have a structural layer. So those are the overstory trees that we have in the background. Our seasonal theme layer comes in purples and yellows and pinks. Here we can see some iris blooming in the midground and various plants and leaf textures. So this is overall a very green landscape or it was when this photograph was taken, but you have very fine textured grasses against the very coarsely textured um, plants there in the midground, And finally, we have our ground cover layer. So things that are low growing grasses or sedges. In this case, next to this pond, we have emergent aquatic vegetation. So again, we're working with our three layers. We're looking at different plants within them. And depending on what the archetype is, how that's going to work is going to be different. Here we have another example. This is a design garden by Roy Diblick. In the structural layer, we have an overstory tree in the midground. We have some background evergreens and a stone wall that kind of add that structure to the garden. So these are the things that are going to be there over the winter when the herbaceous layer is maybe died back or not looking so great. We have our seasonal theme layer. These are yellows, purples, and pinks. Uh, we have some what look like allium bulbs. We have some other aster type plants in the foreground. We also have our ground cover layer. So again, low growing grasses and sedges, 
other low-growing herbs that complement the seasonal layer. So we have, again, these light lavender flowers in the foreground that they reference the strong purples that we have in the midground. So again, our ground cover layer can still be attractive, can still have flower, but importantly, they reinforce what's going on with our seasonal theme layer. So this is the design plant communities presented by Rainier and West in Planting in a Post-Wild World. Their key principles are populations, not individuals, stress as an asset, densely layered plants, and remember that's vertically, not just side by side, attractive and legible landscapes, and management, not maintenance. And so with these principles, they're showing us how we can look at native landscapes, how we can translate those archetypes into designed gardens, and how ultimately we can work with different plant communities and create these new and exciting landscapes that still reference what's working uh, in native landscapes. And ultimately that we use principles of plant ecology and biodiversity as design tools to mimic nature, but in designed and intentional ways. So ecology doesn't change just because we were working with it as a designer. And in fact, uh, ecology and stress are design tools that we can use to specifically help us pick plant communities. I'll mention again a quick plug. If you're interested in learning more about this and receiving some hands-on guidance with how this works, at, particularly at residential scales, Kelly Norris of the Greater Des Moines Botanic Garden and Lisa Orgler with Iowa State University put on a series of these workshops. I have here the tentative dates listed, but if you're interested, please visit the Greater Des Moines Botanical Gardens website for more information. That's the Hort Ecology Design Workshop. Lastly, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure presenting this today, and I hope you're interested in learning more about design plant communities and thinking about how these can work to enhance the sustainability of your own landscapes. Thank you.